Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Som TV podcast. My name is Jason Wise. Today's episode is a, it's a lot of fun. I get to talk to one of my dear friends, Carlo Mandavi, who is a winemaker. He makes some beer. He is a steward of the land, and he's also a really fun guy to party with. He just got back from Italy. They've been working on something called the Monarch Tractor for quite a while which is gonna revolutionize regenerative farming in a major way. We're gonna talk about that, but we're also gonna talk about something that is just so fascinating. His last name, he is a Mandavi. And if you know anything about Napa or California, that is a name that holds water. But the question is, is it a blessing or a curse? So we're going to tackle all of those topics, talk a little bit about the wine he's making with his fiance up in Italy and a number of other things. Before we do that, there is an event coming on Som TV you do not want to miss. It is a live masterclass drink along of the acclaimed film A Year in Burgundy with our own Jill Zamorski and Shakira Jones. We did a rehearsals for this thing and it is just going to be so incredible. They go through you know, they go through the entire film, but they talk about how to get Burgundy for better prices, what the regions are you should look at, what people don't understand about it. You really do not want to miss this. And we have a very limited offering of boutique Burgundy wines we're going to offer for this. This is what they're going to drink when they watch the film. And if you go to www.somtv.com slash a year in Burgundy, you can get a red and a white Burgundy made from a very small family, tiny production. The only place in the United States that you can get it is by doing this. I believe it's $90, including shipping for the two bottles, anywhere in the United States. And it is a really good deal. Anybody who knows Burgundy wines knows that getting good Pinot and Chardonnay from that place is not easy to do, especially something of a very small quantity. So we wanted to do something special for our subscribers and our listeners of the podcast. Please jump on that because when you listen to this, you're only going to have a few days left to order it. The event is April 24th at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We're going to keep it up afterwards, so don't worry. If you miss, you know, you can still order the wine and watch it, providing it hasn't run out. You have to order these Burgundy wines by April 12th. So one more time, the website is www.somtv.com slash a year in Burgundy. Okay, without further ado, my conversation with Carlo Mandavi, you, you do not want to miss this. It's always fun on this uh, on this podcast when I get to shoot the shit with an actual friend. You know, in a lot of cases, I sort of engineer this podcast just to talk to people <laughs> I would talk to anyway. Carlo, you are definitely in the description of that. I mean, it's funny to be talking to you professionally, though we film together. You know, we're just basically friends outside of this. How are you doing, Absolutely. man? First time, first time on the Psalm TV podcast for you. Yeah, Jason, it's so good to to hear you and and uh, to connect with you here. And yeah, like you said, good to be with friends and talk about fun things. And I'm just in awe of all the cool, incredible things because uh, nowadays it seems like I'm watching you or I'm listening to you on the podcast on my drive, <laughs> my drives every day, or on uh, you know Psalm TV. Well, when I started this, I remember when I was a when I was a little girl, I wanted to grow up and impress you. So. <laughs> I, uh, I feel really good. I feel like I'm in, this is the right direction to have gone. But uh, all right, look, let's, we got to talk about a lot. Well, the feeling is mutual. I was saying, how do I impress this iconic film producer, director? Uh, <laughs> iconic. Yeah. I'm, I, there's like, Jason, there's like, what you've done in food and wine is, is incredible. And I just keep loving, like, seeing through Instagram and all the different social ports that we tune into, all the cool things that you're doing. Um, and not just wine and food wise, it's cool. Keep it up. This is great. Thanks for being on the pod. It was good to talk to you and uh, I'll talk to you later. <laughs> yeah. Ciao. We'll see you later. Ciao. That's it. Well, I, you know, the reason you're on is for, you know, it's like kind of a tenfold situation. I mean, obviously last season in verticals, we did an episode on you, which was both about your wine rain, but also about your family and other things. And holy crap, do we have more stuff coming about both of those topics? But we also want to talk about this. I'm going to say it, crazy tractor that you had a hand in working on a major hand called the Monarch Tractor. I'm afraid to get you on the topic of sustainability and and not using chemicals and things because I know you won't shut up, which is a good thing because you're very, very, very passionate about this topic. But I also, I want to talk to you about your last name, Carlos, the Mandavi name. So I'm just going to take one second and kind of do a little bit of an intro from where I stand, what that name means in California and Napa. When I first started bartending, the very first name that I ever learned in wine, before any French name, before anything, was Mandavi. And I don't think I'm unique in that sense. And I think that comes from a number of reasons. One, your grandfather was a hell 
of a marketer, salesman, brand ambassador for that name, Mandavi. And also your family goes back, you know, very, very long time in the wine business, in the agriculture business, in the, I suppose, the saloon business. Is that fair to say? Yeah. Pre-prohibition. Yeah. Saloons. Yeah. A saloon, small little saloon in Northern Minnesota. (laughs) Yeah. But it's still, it's this kind of thing where the name itself has taken on all of these things. And now of course the winery is, you know, Mandavi Winery is now owned by Treasury Wine Estates and... and, Constellation. um, Constellation. I mean, I apologize. In a very, in a very rather dramatic fashion, how all of that stuff happened. But your father, Tim Mandavi, was a winemaker at Opus One, now makes wine over a continuum. I mean, it's, you guys seem to, well, you guys seem to be everywhere in all forms. And of course, there's the side on the Krug Winery family. Let's start from where you are and your perspective as a Mandavi with that last name. Is that a blessing or a curse to have this last name? So I think it's both. There's definitely blessings, um, but there's a lot of weight to bear. There's a lot to live up to. There's a lot of expectations when you kind of walk into a room, especially when you're bringing your own wine. And so a lot of those are are challenges because 99.99% of the wine that you see bearing my family's name, my family has relatively nothing to do with now. And so when you look at that kind of 0.1%, my father's and family's wine continuum, and, and then what Dante and I are doing at Rain, we are doing things at a, at a very high level and particularly on the farming and the cellar. When you walk into that situation where, where people expect to, I don't know how to say this right, but... Um, well, I mean, they, they know you before you know them. It's not like you're a celebrity or something like that. But I mean, is it fair for me to say that up in Napa, the Mandavi name is important. It holds water. I'm just curious from your end. Look, you're very lucky to have that last name. I'm sure it's opened some doors for you. But also, like you said, the expectation of whatever you're going to pour or do also carries that weight, right? Yeah. I mean, and I think the best way to think about it is like, you know, I, I think about it of when I was a child and I remember going into the tasting room. So the technical tasting room, the lab, it was like a lab. And then there was a room where, you know, all the wines were being tasted. And I remember sitting down at the table and there was, you know, a PhD in soil science, a master of wine, a master sommelier, my father, a group of wine growers. And I just sat there and I would watch them talk. And I would just, you know, I remember thinking that there was no way that I would ever be able to sit at that table. The bar was so high that it was impossible to reach it. There was the intimidation factor from a young age. And there was also the intimidation in the market. You know, I remember seeing my grandfather up talking publicly and whether it was at a dinner or an event or a symposium and talking about what he poured his heart and soul into, which is, you know, the food and wine industry, farming and all of that, or my father doing the same thing. And I just remember always being like, I'll never be able to do that. And I still, one of my biggest fears has always been public speaking. <laughs> you know, I'm a pretty shy individual, even though you know me as a friend and we're out yeah. having a good time. I wouldn't and, call you shy, but yeah, okay. Yeah. So yeah, I've gotten over my fear of all of that public speaking. I've done my journey, my walkabout, if you will, um, you know, where I, I traveled. and I, went I mean, I remember sp- that one time in Cancun, you went streaking right down the middle of the street. <laughs> right I, down the middle. <laughs> yeah. I, I, don't, I don't remember that being shy, but anyways, keep going. <laughs> yeah. No, but I think there's the expectations because I do, you know, see my grandfather and the wines that he produced and the goals that he, you know, his goal when he began Robert Mandavi was he felt that we had the soil, the climate, the know-how to make wines that could sit with the great wines of the world in Napa Valley. And he was called crazy for that. And so going from being called crazy to now we have so many regions around the world. It's not just Bordeaux, Burgundy, you know, Champagne, Piemonte, you know, Italy, et cetera. There's a world of wine out there with wines that are capable of sitting alongside the best wines of the world. The world has changed, but that was the goal my grandfather had. And I I really believe that he reached that goal in terms of never being the best, but being in the company of the best. My father was the one kind of in the cellar realizing those wines and the vineyard realizing those wines. My grandfather, like you said, was out talking about those wines. And before that, he was like my father in the vineyard and the cellar, but then he realized that he needed to get out and talk about the wines. There's that, you know, great story. I, in fact, our Fort Ross Seaview, uh, Seafield Vineyard at Rain, we got that vineyard when we first started looking out there. I remember the gentleman, it was Michael Brown who introduced from Costa Brown, now Cirque. He introduced us to this gentleman, Greg Bjordstad, who was doing consulting. He planted flowers. He planted a number of these vineyards. And I remember talking to him the first time and I said, I'm looking for a vineyard out here. And he said, good luck, man. You know, you, you know, it might take you years. <laughs> and six months later, he called me and he said, Carlo, uh, uh, I think you and Dante should come out and check out this vineyard. And, you know, you go through Marcuson and you go through Hirsch and then you dead into this beautiful site and told us all about it. And we're like, amazing. So we headed out there and we walked the vineyard with him. And he said, I planted this vineyard, varying rootstock, you know, it was clone 777. I was really, you know, he, he was telling, pouring his heart and soul into it. And I said, well, 
Greg, what's the story with why is someone giving up this vineyard? What's going on here? And he said, actually, Carlo, it's uh, it's my vineyard. I've been getting the fruit for the last bit. And I realized very quickly that I love to make wine. I love to farm, but I don't enjoy the market. I don't travel. And I think that quickly when my grandfather began Robert Mondavi Winery, he was investing in the vineyards, investing in the cellar, doing all the things to make wines that could sit alongside the best of the world. But he quickly realized that if he didn't get out in the market and show the wines, that no one would listen. And and he had one of those great stories is, you know, his first trip to Chicago with Robert Mondavi, you know, I think it was, it was the 66 vintage. It must've been 68, 67, 68. And he went out to Chicago. It was one of the first stops of a, of a multi-stop little tour. And he brought out the wines and he said, try these wines. This was the first release. He just invested into the winery. He invested into, you know, the whole cellar, into the vineyard, everything. And he gets to these, you know, sommeliers, chefs, restaurants, um, store owners, wine shop owners, Showed the wines and he said, Robert, these wines are really great, but they're like 50 cents more a bottle than what we get Napa Cab for, Napa Pinot for, Napa, you know, wines for. At the time, you could think of, you know, Napa or Sonoma or anything other than Bordeaux and Burgundy wines being traded like barrels of oil. It was $2 a bottle. That's it. And, um, he came back from the trip totally defeated, feeling like, my goodness, like how in the world am I going to convince these guys that these wines can sit alongside the great wines of the world? And so he came back and he thought about it and he blinded the wines. And he said, when you blind these wines, you can see that, you know, all the improvements we made, you can see how the wines aren't flawed, that they're fresh and they're vibrant and they have energy and tension. But I have to convince this to these important buyers. And so he went back out there and this time he brought three bottles and they were in brown bags. And he said, try these three wines and they're blind. So completely blind. And, uh, you know, they would try the wines and they often would prefer his wine. And part of the reason was, was because he had made huge, you know, innovations. First, he realized that there was all sorts of microbiological things happening in the cellar that we didn't understand or know how to control. Britannomyces, Ineococcus, all the different things that you can inherit in a wine by having a clean wine going into a dirty vessel. And so he said, we need to clean this up. So the way that he treated the best wines was um, he started using stainless steel. Steel. He pioneered that from the milk industry. He was the first one to use stainless steel in the wine industry. Crazy story about that. Went to Bordeaux. So wait, it was it was from the milk industry first, the stainless steel stuff you said? Yeah. He pioneered what? that from the milk industry. Yeah. I was with him in Bordeaux at Chateau Aubryon with Jean-Paul Damas, yep, yep, yep. one of the first gross. And there's all these stainless steel tanks. And my grandfather was sitting there on a stool and Jean-Paul Damas said, Robert, these tanks are here because of you. And I remember getting goosebumps because full circle being called crazy for wanting to make wines that could sit alongside the great wines of the world to being in one of the greatest estates in Bordeaux and one of the greatest wines of the world and being told that they changed the way that they're making their wines because of my grandfather. And I just remember being so proud of him and, and seeing this warm smile on his face, but investing in the cellar. So we went to, you know, stainless steel tanks to help with any problems with Brett or any flaws that could be inherited from a fermentation vessel. And then for the best wines, and this is kind of interesting because we're talking about always, how do we get closer to terroir? How do we get closer to these beautiful notes that we smell in the forest and the floor of the fauna, the environment around, how do we get closer to those? And so at the point in time when my grandfather was trying to innovate and push that terroir and fine wine, and we can sit alongside the great wines of the world, we have the soil of Clement de Noel, you know, he went to new oak barrels because when he looked at you know, the winery, the cellar back then it was old whiskey barrels. It was the older, the barrel was kind of considered in a lot of ways, the better the barrel. And so he said, we're going to use new oak. That way you didn't inherit any flaws from the vintage before or the vintage before that. So you had a fresh blank canvas to connect to not just the terroir, but also the vintage variations. And so went to new barrels. So the combination of stainless steel and new oak was so pure and so elegant at the time. That was the step that was a huge, not step, but leap forward in terms of connecting um, to terroir. And so in these blind wines, when he was traveling, people were in such awe of the wines that he was making that oftentimes in the blind tastings, they would say, well, I prefer this wine. There was more fruit, more flour, less of the kind of funk. And he would open the bags and it would be, you know, Aubryon or Margot or Chateau Cheval Blanc. He was putting that best of Bordeaux. So either the first growths or some of the greats of the right bank and then his Robert Mondavi wine. And people were so shocked. They'll say, well, okay, I'll pay 50 cents more for this bottle from Napa. The cool thing, the crazy thing, Jason, is at the time you could buy, you know, Romani Conti, Romani Conti or Lafitte or Margot for like six bucks. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah, these are like thousands of dollars now, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
Well, I should say really fast, anybody who's listening to this, you can see his Fort Ross vineyard he mentioned in the Harvest episode on Som TV, where Carlo harvests the Pinot grapes from there. You can see the 66 Mandavi, obviously, in Som 2, which is titled Into the Bottle. And then his season one verticals on Rain has so many of the things that you're talking about from a standpoint. And also, we're on audio right now, but you, if you haven't seen these episodes, you need to, because you can see how passionate this crazy person is that I'm talking to. It's really inspirational. I looked at your grandfather as a major inspiration for me when I made Som in the way that I was not afraid to go out and promote myself, promote the film, stand up for what I believed it was. And he was really the inspiration for that. I know it sounds crazy, but he was. I look at him as one of the most important American, I hate to use the word salesman, but I'm going to use it because he was somebody who was not afraid to say, look what we're doing. It's a team effort. And look what everyone around me is doing. I mean, the way he propped up the other wineries in Napa, season one verticals is a perfect example of how every single one of those episodes feeds into Mondavi in a weird way. Chapelet, they borrowed equipment from Mondavi on their first vintage because it was a disaster. In a lot of cases, he helped people get Chardonnay grapes when they couldn't get Chardonnay grapes. He helped others, you know, he would buy grapes from people when they were in trouble. He did everything he could because he knew, and as you know, he's been quoted many times to say, you know, the rising tide rises all ships. And he was a big proponent of if Napa has 20, 30, 100 strong, really good, successful wineries producing a top notch quality wine, everybody is going to benefit. Everyone's going to make more money. The region itself will succeed. And I look at that mentality right now the same way I feel about wine films and content. I don't want to be the only one. <laughs> I want others to come in and make good stuff. I mean, of course, I don't want it to be better than mine, but but <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But, uh, but it's really this kind of mentality in that I think there is this really important aspect of helping others and that helps you too. Yeah. And I think yeah. it's, you know, that's something your grandfather, he walked the walk in regards to that. Yeah. And he also was willing to take the risk because just like you with when you came out with Psalm, I mean, I remember the first time he told me this and it hit me like a ton of bricks. He said, you realize that you know, the biggest risk you can take in life is not taking a risk at all. And um, he embraced that idea. And he also would always say, you have to pour your heart and soul into whatever you do in life if you want to excel. And that was also overall the philosophy that he had throughout any decision making, whether it was personal or professional, was this idea of you have to pour your heart and soul into your life. It wasn't always maybe the right financial decision, but it was definitely the right long-term decision. <laughs> yes. And, you know, and he did it. He, he lived by it. And he was, um, he did, he wanted to prove that we can make wines that could sit among the great wines of the world. And, you know, I would watch him taste and we would travel. I was fortunate. I got to spend a lot of time with my grandfather in the sense that, you know, I was 28 when he went on to the great vineyard in the sky and we got to travel throughout the world, tasting wines. And I, I learned so much from him, but it all tied back to the philosophy of this wine has heart and soul. You can tell that they were putting their heart and soul into what they were doing. And he used that kind of measure for almost anything he did in life. As an outsider, you know, somebody that doesn't, I don't make wine. Maybe someday I'll get a chance to do something wonderful like that. But I get to observe your world from the outside. And I think some of the best decisions I've seen made over the course of hundreds of years in wine have not been for financial reasons. They have, in fact, been so counterintuitive to making money. I look at like Jean-Louis Schaub's family, the Schaub's and Hermitage and all of these decisions they have made to keep going. Now their wine is very expensive. Some of their bottles sell for thousands of dollars, but they have barely survived for hundred year periods of time. You know, they've had to plant vegetables on their land occasionally just to like keep going. But the decisions that they made over the long term ended up putting them where they are now. And I and I see that it's funny you say, I, I don't know if it was the right financial decision. I think the best decisions in wine are a CFO's nightmare. You know, yeah, yeah <laughs> they yeah. really are. No, I, I totally agree. And that's like, you know, Dante and I with beginning rain. Every single penny we've had has gone back into the farming. And, you know, there's so many arguments. Does that actually help? For us, it's a product of so many more things than just a liquid that you put in your body. And I will argue all day long that it does matter, that it's very important, and that these things, all these things, all these little steps matter. But a CFO will print out a whole list of reasons why you can skip a lot of things and go a different route and make a quality product that costs a fraction of what you're doing. And so, there's so many little things that I think are important. And I think that I learned. I think what we're getting at is that CFOs are evil, terrible people and they need to be removed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That I hope my CFO <laughs> is listening to this because he, he'll tell me we don't have budgets for podcasts anymore. They're done. Yeah. I clipped. <laughs> Delete that podcast, please. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's also the wonderful thing about when you drink a bottle of Shav, you can sense that history and uh, you, you can sense the the care that the family has. And when you get to connect with someone like Jean-Louis through one of your 
podcast or your, you know, Psalm TV or even Psalm the film, you really understand the depths of the wine just by seeing you two taste and hearing him talk about them. And hey, that means um, a lot. I appreciate that. But I also think, I think that's the thing I, why I started this pot off with asking you about your family name because there's very few businesses like wine where the name is part of the business. You know, look at Lafitte Rothschild. You know, Lafitte is the last name. I mean, if you think about all of the famous names, Mandavi, all these things, they're based on the name. Yeah. And so that's why I wanted to start the podcast with what is it meant to you to have this name as a blessing or a curse? And I know, I mean, Mandavi is trademarked now by another company, which has got to be very strange for you having the last name. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's a blessing and a curse. Could you make a Mandavi wine? Are you allowed? No, but I mean, I wouldn't either. You know, I think um, it goes back to Charles Krug. The first bottlings of Mandavi go back to Charles Krug. And then Constellation now owns Robert Mandavi, the trademark. And, um, you know, I think that they should have, they paid for it. It's it's their their name. But also at the same time, you know, when Dante and I began, rain is something completely different from everything that was happening at Robert Mandavi. We're in a different vineyard. We're doing things, you know, along the lines of what my grandfather, the fire in his belly that he had back in 1960. 66, but in a very different scale. We're only 18 and a half acres total. That's all of the vineyard land that we have for rain. So we're very, very, very small. You know, and then when you look at continuum, same thing. I mean, continuum's more aligned with Opus One in terms of its singular focus in one bottle, but uh, in terms of even that, we're we're a fraction of that. It's a total of, you know, just 65 acres of vines, which 15 of those are are young vines. So it's a very small production as well. I should Um, just say really fast, Rain Pinot, speaking objectively, I happen to, you know, personally like you a lot. You know, we've traveled a lot. I've seen you go streaking in Cancun. Your <laughs> wine, the Rain Pinot, you know, all of the wines that you make up there are fantastic. And they are, I think this really interesting, I know you're not trying to make wine that's a middle ground, but you know, if you're a, for lack of a better term, like a hipster psalm and you want lighter balanced wines, this fits the bill. But if you're somebody who wants a really elegant, important, a lot of complexity type of a wine, it's also that too. I think what you pulled off with Rain is pretty remarkable. If you're listening to the pod, you absolutely should buy it. You guys don't make enough. In fact, every time you offer those large format bottles, I scramble to try to order them and they're gone. Every damn time you send an email, I gotta. I should just be texting you to put one aside for me. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, we only make like eighty of them of each vineyard, all three bottlings. Tying back to the elegance, Jason is something, and, and thanks for those kind words. Is something that goes back to my whole journey and why my grandfather always said that a wine should not overpower the meal; that it should elevate the meal. The meal should elevate the wine. You know, there was this from I would say like ninety five until maybe five, even just a decade ago, maybe this movement of power. It was like wines had to be more powerful, bigger, extracted, and that didn't just mean Cabernet. There were people who were doing that with Pinot Noir. They were doing it with Syrah. They were doing it with, you know, even Chardonnay. They were really trying to just create extract depth and length in wines that maybe wasn't naturally there. And the wines oftentimes were a bit disjointed and would overpower or dominate a meal and didn't really have, in my mind's eye, that idea of elegance and, and this symbiotic relationship with the meal. And so when Dante and I began Rain, we're going to make it small enough. You know, we started off with only a few hundred cases and now we're 18 and a half acres of vines. But when we began, our goal was to have that goal to say, hey, I think you cover this really well and with Raj and his Pinot Noir with Domain. De La Cope. Yeah, third one. But you know, this idea that we can make wines that can sit alongside the great wines of the world, that we can make Pinot Noir also out on the extreme Sonoma coast <clears throat> that can sit along the best of the world. And so when we did that, I mean, also on the journey, I did a stint at Domaine du Jacques. And I remember this dinner, one of the first dinners and the Cess family are the most gracious, generous, kind, loving families, and really one of the great producers of Pinot Noir in the world, not just Burgundy, but in the world and certainly have the crews and the focus to, and the wines to, to demonstrate that. But I remember this first dinner we were having and every wine was blind. It was one of my favorite things. All wines were blind. Lunch wines, dinner wines, everything blind. It could have been, you know, a bottle of port and it was blind. And I remember one of the first bottlings. And the cool thing was that everyone ran, went around the table. It wasn't just, you know, what is it? It was this, uh, is this old world or is this new world? It was a whole breakdown. And we go around the table and we talk about the wines. And I remember one of the days it was a Pinot Noir, old world Pinot Noir. It was very translucent in color, not to say quite rosé, but like just a shade more ruby than rosé and aromatic and beautiful. And uh, 
I was looking at the wines and I said, well, this wine's very light in color. And Jacques says, stop me. He said, Carlo, in Burgundy, we do not look at the color. And I remember thinking, my God, like I have to kind of read, because we, whether it's being a sommelier or being a winemaker, one of the things you observe right away is the color. And he went on to talk about some of the wines that inspired him to start Domaine du Jacques. And they were like these old, old bottles from the 20s and 30s of Romani Conti that were just effervescent, super light in color, and just jumping out of the glass with aromatics and with depth and length. I remember thinking to myself, my gosh, like I've been observing wines so differently. And I did have a bit of that house palette. I was definitely at that point in time studying like mad. I was on this some kind of like tasting group, like any group I could get into to blind wines, to taste wines. I was on this tear to learn as much as I possibly could. And it was a humbling moment for me to realize, you know, I remember also with the first vintage of rain, I, I was thinking that the wines were so light in color. And then I thought, you know, I think Jacques Sess might be proud of that because it's not all about extract. It's not all about power. It's about elegance and about, th this is for me at least. And so rain across the board from the very beginning is very transparent in it's showing of the vintage. It's very transparent and it's showing of the terroir. We don't overpower it. We don't smash it with oak. We don't over extract it. We want the wines to be very delicate, very ethereal. Not to say that that's something we go out. We go out to try to represent the terroir the best we can, but the wines, because of our farming decisions and our picking decisions tend to be on the more elegant side. I've always gravitated now. I don't want to say just now, but I always have gravitated towards aromatics and elegance. Part of that came from my grandfather, my father's drive for elegance. And even in big wines, and even in bigger Cabernets or Syrahs, when they can be quite unctuous, there's always this for me, in a good seller, there's always this elegance that comes through. Amazing. I want to ask you a question because I'm turned on right now and I'm <laughs> curious, are you single? <clears throat> no, no, I'm I'm very much not single. I am uh, in a very happy, awesome relationship. I'm engaged to a beautiful winemaker from Italy, her and her sister, Serena. Are Rana you saying wine. that I have no chance with you? Is that what you're saying right now? <laughs> Come on, baby. <laughs> 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 no, your your fiance is is gorgeous. I yeah. I, I look forward very much to when you guys can bounce back and forth easily between Italy and America when this chaos is uh, easing up to say the least. We're one step closer. I was just in Italy for three weeks because I have my Italian citizenship, which has been, I got I got my Italian, Jason, this is crazy. I got my Italian citizenship four months before lockdown began. And so it was one of those things when I began dating Joe, we've been together now for four years. And when I began dating her, I said, you know what? I think I can get my Italian citizenship through my great grandfather, through this like kind of blood passage. And so I was able to get that and then lockdown happened and I was able to go there, but she was locked down over there, not able to come here. And I met you know, on these empty flights to Europe, it was crazy. I met couples that had been separated for months and months and months. One thing we don't realize how many global couples there are in relationships that that span. I mean, speaking of Dujac, there's Diana and Jeremy that span, you know, two places of on earth or two countries. So we were blocked and, you know, I would have to come back, obviously, but I've been going back and forth. And finally, 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 as of literally a week ago, she was able to come back with me for the first time in a year, which is just crazy. Man, that's tough. In lieu of being able to date you myself, I think it's uh, <laughs> it's good. And that's, and that's very tough that you have to deal with the long distance stuff. All right, let's get back to farming. I'm going to keep you uh, against the rails here because you are so passionate when it comes to sustainability and proper farming and organics and all of the right stuff. And I know that you are very against the use of life or Roundup or whatever name you want to call it for a lot of reasons. And this could be a literal podcast series with you. You are, I hope I say this properly, a co-inventor, is that right, of the Monarch Tractor? And I want to, I want to talk about what that is and what it could mean for farming. What is your role in creating this device? Yeah. So I'm one of the co-founders. There's three co-founders and I'm, I get the very, talking about CFOs, my title actually comes out to be CFO. I'm the chief farming officer. <laughs> of Monarch Tractor, which is the solution to one of the biggest challenges. I began a thing called the Monarch Challenge back in late 2016. And it was a challenge that was basically to go out and talk to farms about why we should not use glyphosate. This is before all the Monsanto Roundup lawsuits. And the way it happened was quite organic. I watched the vineyards that my family had been farming for decades, for generations, go from my family's farming care to the farming care of another company. And I watched, and this is kind of the sad thing is we talk about sustainability. We're fortunate to be able to tune in to hear you talk about wines. You're talking to some of the best wineries in the world and their farming is paramount and important to them. But most of them are just like rain. They're like 18 and a half acres or 50 acres. They're not 
you know, a substantial piece of land. And what I realized when my family sold Robert Mondavi is that the great swath of farmland in America is being consolidated. So while we're going down the right path at Rain and at Continuum and so many of the wines that we love, that the actual industry was going the wrong way. And so I remember driving up to my father's house and the land that was once ours was now no longer ours and under the farming tutelage of another company. And I remember seeing these electric orange strips underneath the vine during this time of year, spring. So beautiful green, lush hills with these electric orange strips. And I was going, what in the heck is that? And I got up to my father's home and I was again in the echo chamber of my family's wine business. I was younger and this is before my trip to Burgundy and et cetera. And, you know, he said, well, they're chemically mowing the vineyard. I said, chemically mowing? What in the world? So I began researching it and I began seeing it more and more. And I began seeing it in like orchards and I began seeing it all over the place. So then I, I did a bit deeper of a dive and I learned that since the introduction of Roundup in 1974, so a relatively new product, and I had always thought that this was just the way it was. But no, this chemical movement or what they actually call the Green Revolution happened post-World War I and World War II. And it was this massive uptake of all the things that we were putting into the war, then turned around and, and using those chemicals from not building bombs, but trying to use them to, you know, uh, potassium nitrate bombs became nitrogen to be able to make it so you didn't have to turn a crop that you could literally just farm and just add nitrogen and you wouldn't have to have a nitrogen fixer to take a nitrogen depleter. The turning of crops changed. But I realized that right now we were we were actually as a world as a planet going down the wrong way we were driving like not in like second gear the wrong way we're driving like in fifth gear pedal to the metal the wrong way in farming you have to be very careful you cannot become this preachy person that goes out and talks because we're all in this boat together. It's not easy. It's difficult. All of these farms that were and were not, you know, using were friends of mine. And so I didn't know how to do this. I was told not to, you know, go out and talk about this with people. But I began this movement because I figured that, in my opinion, if you want to go off and do something crazy, by all means, go do it. But there's certain things in life that don't just affect you and your piece of dirt, they affect a much bigger piece. And, and the reason why I began the Monarch Challenge was because since that introduction in 74 of Roundup, the Monarch population of butterflies has declined by 99% and they're on the brink of extinction. Glyphosate plus neonicotinoids, which is another thing farmers use, is the cocktail of death for the bees and colony collapse disorder. So there's all these things. And I said, well, I can get out and talk to people and just create awareness. And so I linked up with Dr. Stephanie Seneff, who's a senior researcher at MIT and got a lot of the human health problems on paper. I put some of the environmental impact problems on paper and I went around and created a little board and we went around and we talked with people just to create awareness and just to say, hey, did you know that Roundup's linked to non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and Parkinson's and autism and all sorts of other autoimmune disorders and blah, blah, blah. Did you know it's linked to these environmental impact problems? And it was the most defeating two years, three years of my life because I'd go talk to these people and they would say, like with a tear in their eye, I did not know that. This was also before the lawsuits happened with Monsanto. I did not know that, but I got to put food on the table for my kids. I got to put my kids through college at some point in time. We think of farming as this like very incredible year on the land. It's beautiful. But the reality is that for most farms, and we're very fortunate in vineyards that were not like this thin penny margin like corn and soy, that it's tough. It's not easy. And this is on a global basis, by the way, uh, Jason, as, as you know, you know, this spans France, this spans Italy, this spans global and not just vineyards. When I talk about, you know, these chemicals, they are much more heavily used in corn and soy. And this is a global problem with a global challenge. And I remember at a point in time, I just felt like this wasn't going to work, that I wasn't going to be able to meet this challenge. I initially came out like, you know, anyone just thinking we can get this just by creating awareness, this will change. And by the next couple of years, Napa and Sonoma is going to be herbicide free. We're going to see this happen on a global basis. Let's just create awareness. And that wasn't the case. It was so defeating. Yes, we converted thousands of acres. We definitely made an impact. They did see that the margin was small. It was like two cents a bottle, basically. But if you take two cents a bottle and you multiply that by just like the 45,000 acres of Napa, it's something like $25 million. It was a big investment for the bigger corporate farms. And for the smaller farms that were struggling, it was too big of an investment, et cetera. So fast forward to kind of getting into the Monarch tractor and trying to find a solution. That came very organically. One of the cool things about Sonoma and Napa is that just jumped jump over San Francisco, you land in Silicon Valley and you've got, you know, Tesla and you've got Google and you've got Facebook and all these crazy, you know, brilliant minds innovating all sorts of crazy things. And I remember driving 
a Tesla, the first like kind of autonomous geared Tesla, you could put it like in ludicrous mode and have it go down the freeway at 70 miles per hour and it would change lanes without doing anything. And I remember thinking if you can go down the freeway at 70 miles per hour, you can go down a vineyard row at two and three miles per hour autonomously. You can then get rid of hazmat suits and you no longer have to have farmers near the, because one of the big things is that these farmers are also dear friends of mine and sitting in that tractor cockpit is mundane. It's tough. And you're in the spray, whether you're spraying organic contact sprays or you're spraying systemic, you know, synthetics, whatever, you're in the middle of it. And so you could get rid of the hazmat suits. You could protect the farmers. You could have them do other things and you could have a fully autonomous spray system that would work. I'm talking about for mildew pressure. And then the biggest thing is that you could- Which is spraying what? spraying copper or spraying like what would that be copper sulfur those are like the most common would be copper and sulfur copper more in europe for like odium and then for napa sonoma you see more sulfur but the really cool thing is that you can now slow everything down you can work on a 24-hour clock and i learned about another big challenge and i remember this really hit home in 2017 when we had the wildfires in napa valley and sonoma and mendocino and it was just like oh my gosh what in the heck is going on like And then that happened again in 2020. And it was just, we were seeing climate change and the temperatures run out of control and it's compacting. As you look at Australia, Siberia, the Amazon, all these places burning, taking a lot of the things that are fixing nitrogen, pulling nitrogen out of the air, helping fix greenhouse gases into the soils. And we're seeing that those balancing factors are being burnt because of climate change. And then not to mention, we continue to add to it. And the interesting thing is, is that along this journey, one of the things I heard from farmers was, look, man, like I get it herbicides aren't good, but driving your tractor more and burning more fossil fuels is not good either. So actually what you're talking about, this organic thing or beyond organic clean farming is actually worse for the environment because what's the bigger challenge protecting our soil microbiome or and all the things downriver from it or protecting our environment in terms of the climate and protecting climate change. And I said, well, can't you figure out a way to solve both of those? With Monarch Tractor, it's the world's most powerful compact tractor. It's smart, it's electric, it's driver optional, meaning that it has autonomous capabilities and not just just autonomous capabilities to go up and down the rows, autonomous operations. So you can autonomously mow, you can autonomously spray, you can autonomously under the vine weed. That means that you're no longer putting your tractor driver in there and you're racing to get down the vineyard row, that you can slow things way down. All of this is on an electric platform. I just want to say something to people listening to this thinking, why do I need to know about this stuff to drink wine? And the obvious answer is your health, the world's health. Okay, great. But if you don't care about that stuff, you should understand where wine comes from. And I I think this is such a really positive thing about the younger generation is they ask, where does my food come from? What are the ingredients in this alcohol? They want to know this stuff. And this, what you're talking about right now is as important a conversation to have about wine as, you know, is it from Burgundy? Where's it from? How much does it cost? Who made it? This is that important of a conversation. I'm not trying to interrupt you. I just want listeners to understand this is as much about wine as anything else you talk about wine while you're sitting there drinking it at the table. This is important. So I think it's bigger than that, Jason. That exactly what you said, but this is also so that we have a planet that we can make wine on, that we have an inhabitable place. Like when you look at the temperatures and what's happening in Burgundy, when you look at the things that's happening in Piemonte with the severe weather or in Sonoma and Napa with the fires in Australia, this is just the base kind of let's keep going forward, but let's also find a path to survive, but let's not choose what's better to protect and not. Let's protect both. And so we have to find a way to protect our soil microbiomes, the environment, the planet, all the beautiful insects and different beneficials that we need to have a thriving world. Let's not put those in second place and let's not put our planet and the climate in second place. And so Being able to go from fossil fuel farming, getting rid of diesel tanks and bridge over and go to renewable energy farming. We talk about things that people can farm, corn, soy, grapes, all these different things. But what we've never talked about on the lands and that we should be talking about more is that there's dual crops and that second crop is energy. We no longer need to mine for oil to have it trucked over, to have it power my tractor. I can now capture through solar, geothermal, hydro, all sorts of different renewable energy resources, the ability to power those tools and to be able to operate the farm. And then all of a sudden, you're more independent and less dependent on third-party services. And so you have this kind of closed loop farm and that does translate to greater health, not just for the farmer or for the soil microbiome or the environment. It also translates to a healthier glass of wine, a healthier breakfast cereal or whatever it is. The cool thing about being one of the founders of this company is that I've been able to focus this on vineyards. And so right now, one of you know the main crops is vineyards, obviously other fruits and vegetables. We've made it a pretty tricked out tractor for vineyards. I've got one of the first ones coming to my farm, which I'm excited about. <laughs> so, Very cool. 
Very cool. Where can people learn more about the Monarch Tractor? I mean, we're going to do something on Som TV about it so people can sort of see it in action, but where can they learn right now if they just want to see what it does and what it looks like? Yeah, I think the best place is monarchtractor.com. That kind of shows everything. But once you search Monarch Tractor, I think you can start to see three different articles and stuff there. We've got a really great tailwind. We've got incredible support from the farming community. The one thing, Jason, that's really cool is we've got support from a lot of the farms that are organic. We've got support from the big, big, big companies, you know, the companies that can really affect huge change in vineyards and really help offset the carbon footprint and kind of chemical exposure. And then we've got a very cool global following. I mean, I was just in awe by the interest from France, from Italy, from Spain, from Australia and New Zealand, um, all the wine regions around the world. And then also we had, you know, some interesting, like from Norway and from England and from Africa. That doesn't surprise me though. You know, Norway, the Nordic countries are pretty forward thinking when it comes to this type of stuff. So that doesn't surprise me. Yeah, no, I was, I was, I didn't know this before, but Mark, who's one of my co-founders and came from the early days at Tesla was like, well, yeah, Norway is actually the number one export for Tesla, which I didn't realize. And so they're very hip to electric power and they're very hip to renewable energy. So that was something that was, you know, one of the cool things I learned along this little journey. I just say that there was two years of incredible depression on the Monarch Challenge. And then there was about six months of trying to get the team together for Monarch Tractor. And then when I met Mark Praveen and Zachary, my three co-founders, it all came together very quickly. And now I'm re-fired up and I'm once again excited about the prospect of us being able to achieve our goals that the Monarch Challenge set out way back in late 2016, that we will be able to realize those through this technology. So I think it's coming full circle. And we're, we're launching the first tractors on Earth Day coming up on the 22nd of April. Man, this is great. This is just great news. And in fact, you've been able to do it during all the COVID stuff and everything. You know, Carlo, it's uh, always a pleasure to have you on this. I look forward to our next glass of wine together now that you're back in the States. Thank you, brother. All right, buddy. It's good to talk to you. Be safe. Thanks, okay? brother. All right. All right. Thanks, Jason. Bye. Take care. Bye. Thank you, everybody, for listening. I hope you enjoyed. Carlo, uh, we have a lot more coming with him and also the Mandabi family. I wish I was allowed to tell you about it, but unfortunately, you're going to have to be a Som TV subscriber and stick with us. Do not forget to go to somtv.com slash a year in Burgundy to get our $90 watch along offer that is coming soon on Som TV with Shakira Jones and Jill Zamorski. I promise you, I would not be hyping this if it was not going to be worth it. All right, everybody, please be safe and drink good wine. Life's too short.